Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Now while it's not exactly what I'd consider budget, a lot of you on Instagram were asking me to put together a PC build which features the Ryzen 5 3600 and considering it seems to be the new value king in terms of price to performance, it's a very good all-rounder from what I've read in reviews, I thought why not as it may be something that a lot of you decide to opt for if you want to put together a brand new AMD based PC. I'm also going to be throwing in a couple of used deals that I got to make this build possible as well. So without further ado, let's get into it and talk about what I've put together. So I thought we'd start with the core components. Here we have the Ryzen 5 3600, 16 gigs of Vengeance LPX 3200 MHz DDR4 and a BIOS Star Racing B350 ET2 which will need a BIOS flash much like a lot of older boards. Now this was relatively cheap and to flash the BIOS all I did was go to the BIOS Star site, download the latest version of the BIOS software and I did need a cheap AMD CPU in order to get it to boot in the first place. I used an Athlon in this motherboard I booted up into Windows, downloaded this software here, put it on a USB drive and then flashed the BIOS so that it was compatible with the new Ryzen 3000 chips. That's something that's unavoidable at this moment. Of course you can just purchase a cheap Athlon APU, something like that, flash the BIOS and then send that chip back. Now we're going to put the motherboard bundle together outside of the case simply for convenience sake. You want to be very careful with AM4 CPUs much like previous generation AMD CPUs because of the pins. They can be bent very easily. Now the first thing to do is lift the little retention handle on the motherboard here and check that the little gold arrow on the processor itself right here in the top left corner if my camera wants to focus lines up with the little arrow on the motherboard because there is only one way that this CPU will go in and work if you try and force it in you may end up as I say damaging some of the very sensitive pins this just drops in there like so and then you can push the handle down now we need to install the cooler and to do that we have to remove these brackets which would be suited to an Athlon processor and heatsink but for the Ryzen we need to remove the four screws here and remove the brackets that would hold an old style AMD cooler in place. Again, this is very easy to do, just make sure you put these to one side and keep them safe just in case you ever want to sell your motherboard on and have to reinstall these little things. We're still going to need to keep this little bracket underneath so that we can install the AM4 heatsink on top of the 3600 processor. This just goes back under here and the heatsink screws back onto it. Of course these heatsinks come with pre-applied thermal paste. I recommend you install it the same way around as I'm doing with the AMD writing at the back simply so it doesn't block the RAM channels here. Now once you've done that it takes four screws to hold this down. I like to hold it like this so that I'm getting a good connection between the heatsink and the bracket underneath but you can do it on a flat solid surface as well. This is just the way I've always done things and you'll find that once you've built a PC or maybe a couple of PCs, you'll develop your own habits which you may prefer to employ when you're putting together a system. Ask anyone and they'll all have their own unique method of doing certain things. But as long as the PC works at the end of the build, well, you can't really do anything wrong. Just don't build your PC underwater and <laughs> you'll be fine. Just check that that sits flush with the board underneath and don't forget to plug in the cable of course because otherwise your PC will immediately overheat and switch off. Alright so the next thing we're going to do is install the RAM modules here. We've got two 8 gig sticks of Vengeance LPX. This is simple just unclip the well clips on the motherboard and push these down until the clips click. That's a bit of a tongue twister. Next up, we're going to prepare the case. I've got a little Thermaltake Versa H15 Micro ATX enclosure here. A relatively cheap case, yet one that still features more than enough space inside for all of today's components. Though, if you want slightly better airflow, then I'd suggest getting something bigger. Don't forget to keep these screws safe. And remember to make sure that the motherboard standoffs are already in place. If not, then they'll be included in a little bag should you buy a brand new case. It's then important to make sure that they line up with the holes on your motherboard before putting the board in the case itself. I'm also going to remove this rear fan here because this will only get in the way as we try to install our backplate in a minute. Usually 
Cases will include one fan. I can't speak for the quality of all of them, but the one here seems to be quite good. We'll just remove this and put it aside for later. Next up, we need to put the back plate in. And this is, again, very simple. Just make sure it's the right way round. All it does is clip into place here. It's a relatively simple process. In the case with this back plate, I had a few of these little guards to remove before we could put the motherboard in the case. Otherwise, it won't sit flush and you won't be able to use all of the connectors. These are so flimsy, I'm surprised they haven't just fallen off in the box. All you do is sort of bend them upwards and remove them. You can dispose of them how you see fit but it's important that you do so if your board has any of these attached to the back plate. I'm now going to get these wires out of the way so we've got a little more room to work with inside the case here and I'm going to remove the other side panel just to make cable management a little bit easier. You don't have to do this but I'd recommend it if you want to run a few of the cables around the back. As you can see, this isn't the most cable management friendly case in the world, but it is cheap and it should do the job. Next up, we're going to put the motherboard in place. We're going to sit it on top of those aforementioned standoffs here. And now that we've removed the protective plates at the back, those little silver things, this should fit in here just fine. Now the motherboard will screw down with these little screws that should be included with your new case. This generally takes about six screws to secure your board, at least it does with micro ATX versions, like the BioStar one here. I've sped up the process a little bit because watching someone screw, I'm going to stop that sentence right there, um, but yeah, some parts are boring to watch, especially when I'm sure most of you guys are interested in the core components of this setup. This pesky screw here by the RAM slots is always a pain but with a little persistence and perhaps a smaller screwdriver should be secured with relative ease. Right so let's install everything else and next up is the Seasonic Focus Plus 550 watt PSU. The fact that this was marked down due to being so called open box from its £75 recommended retail price down to 45 made it all the more tempting too. Now there were a few issues with this when it first came out with the GPU I'm using, but if you purchased it since January of 2018 then things should now be fine. So once that's all screwed in there we can move on to removing this hard drive and SSD enclosure. If you're just installing an SSD in this system then you could leave this out entirely as there are other mounting points around this PC, but I'll be adding a hard drive back in. I then put these cables around the back for better cable management and it was time to attach all the necessary cables to our Seasonic PSU here, starting with the power cable. Now, if you don't have a modular PSU, this process is obviously a lot more simple. You've just got to try and work out where you want things in order to maintain the best airflow and to get things as neat as possible. Of course, you don't have to do any cable management. You can just have your wires running all over the place if you want. I've tried to keep things relatively neat here for the time being, but it's probably something I'll go back and try and improve a little bit more after I've put this PC together and used it for a couple of weeks. So next up, we're plugging in the main CPU power connector here, followed by the SATA power cable. We don't need to plug it in at the other end just yet, we're just attaching everything to the power supply as required, and we can move all of the cables out of the way for later. Last to go in is the cable that will connect our GPU to the PSU. I'm now going to attach the cables that we put around the back earlier, including the HD audio, USB 2 and USB 3 headers. It's a little bit of a tight squeeze down here in regards to the USB 2 and USB 3 headers, and I don't think this board is particularly well designed in that regard. As you can see, it's quite tight here, squeezing the USB 3 header next to the USB 2, but I have started to do a little bit of cable management as you can see. Now for the front panel connectors, usually this is quite fiddly, but more and more manufacturers are starting to label the motherboards. Let me show you here. All you have to do is line the name on the connector up with the motherboard. See, for example, it says HD LED and power switch, etc. All you have to do is just run the appropriate cable to the appropriate slot and you should be good to go. It's almost impossible to film because it's so fiddly. But with the wires in place, I'm going to move on to the hard drive enclosure. Now I'm going to install an SSD and 
traditional hard drive in here. This is a 240 gig Kingston. The reason for that is because I like quick access to my drives because I'm always moving them around, benchmarking different things, etc. But you can install them however you wish. I've installed the SSD to the top of the enclosure here with a couple of screws, and I'm going to put this back in place now. We know that the cables aren't obstructing it, and next up, we need to put the hard disk drive back in place. I'm using a one terabyte Western Digital, my usual drive with all my games. And in the case, we did get some of these little brackets as well. This won't be the neatest configuration in the world, but as I say, this is for ease of access. I like to be able to unplug my drive quickly, get it out the front there without needing to root around the back of the case. And setting things up like this is perfect for me. But as I say, feel free to do things how you wish. I might go back and adjust these cables a little later on. With the power connected to the drives, it's time to attach the SATA cables from the motherboard to the drives as well, starting with the hard disk drive at the bottom. This again is a relatively simple process, just plug one end into the drive and the other into the appropriate motherboard headers. This has four SATA connectors here, so there is plenty of room for upgrade in the future as well as another drive bay here. We'll then connect the SSD and last but not least, install the graphics card. I've gone with an MSI Vega 56 Air Boost Edition. The reason I've gone for a Vega 56 is because since the release of the 5700 and XT, prices of these have started to go down and the driver support has really improved. For example, when these first came out, they were closer in performance to a 1070, but now they sit quite close to a 1080. They're around 8 to 9% slower on average, but considering the price you can find these for, that's really not bad. I paid £190 for this one used, which I think was a pretty decent deal. It does have a blower style cooler on it, so it may run a little louder than other aftermarket cards, but I can't complain for the price. Now, installing the graphics card is simple. Just remove a couple of the back plates, insert the card in the PCI Express slot and attach the power connector. In this case, it requires two 8-pin connectors because it is what professionals would call a juicy card. We'll then finish things off by reinstalling that rear fan, which is very important to remember due to airflow. We don't want our system to get too hot once we have the side panel back on. And with that done, there's just one final step. Hang on, what's happened here? So, what can the Ryzen 5 3600 and Vega 56 combo do? Well, why don't we find that out right now? Now, I wasn't quite sure what to expect when initially firing up Cinebench R15, but it's safe to say the result shocked me a little bit. 1567 is certainly a world away from my previous i5-8400. In fact, it left that in the dust a little bit. So I ran a few modern and popular titles at both 1080p and 1440p with the ultra settings and safe to say this PC really is very capable. I think it's a fantastic mid-range setup when it comes to tackling the latest AAA releases. Now the processor actually took a little bit of a backseat relaxing in a lot of these games while the Vega 56 did hit 99 100% usage that just means that it's being utilized to its full potential and the CPU could easily be paired with something more powerful so if you've got a card in mind any card don't hesitate to pair it with the 3600 here as it really will do a fantastic job as we make our way through these games you'll see that this system is ideal for ultra settings here I think the 3600, much like the 2600 and the 1600 before it, has become the new go-to processor for those looking to build something in the mid-range sector. And you should have no quarrels about pairing it with something like a Vega 56 either, because the used market for them now seems to be getting better and better. Just be aware that they are quite juicy cards, but a good quality 550 watt power supply should still be enough. With all that said, thank you very much for watching. I hope this helps any of you out who are wondering about whether or not to buy this CPU and whether you should pair it with a Vega 56. Let me know your thoughts on this processor down below. Leave a like if you enjoyed it. Leave a dislike if you didn't. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. And hopefully, I'll see you all in the next one.